Okay, we're gonna look here at this system of equations and we're gonna solve this using an augmented matrix and reduced row echelon form. So we're gonna let the calculator do the kind of heavy lifting. We really wanna just focus on interpreting the input and the output there. So, all right, before we set up that augmented matrix though and let the calculator do that, just a couple things to notice about this. I've got three equations with four variables. So it's an underdetermined system. So it's not a square system. Uh, I also notice that the right-hand side of all these equations is zero. So it's a homogeneous system of equations. Uh, and when you have a homogeneous system of equations, one important thing about that is that all the variables being zero will always be a solution, right? That's pretty easy to see that when x, y, z, and w are all zero, that makes all of these equations true. So a homogeneous system will always have at least one solution. The question is, does it have more than one solution? And with this one being an underdetermined system, knowing that I have at least one solution, all zeros, and an underdetermined system should tell me that I should expect to get infinitely many solutions for this system. So it would be a dependent system. All right, so those are all vocabulary words we've been using for a while, but just make sure that we remember them and think about what they're telling us about this system. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and write down the augmented matrix for this system. So on the left side of the matrix, I'll have all the coefficients. I just wanna make sure those are all lined up. I have these equations already written with all the variables kind of lined up so it's easy to put in matrix form. I'm gonna put my little dashed line here. You can put a solid line, a dashed line. Sometimes people put colons. Sometimes people don't put anything at all there. But I do like to separate the coefficients from the constant term. All right, so there is our augmented matrix. I'm gonna put that into my calculator or an app to make the calculator or app do the kind of computation for that. So in order to do that, I have to make sure I'm clear about what I'm entering. This is a three by five matrix. So three rows, five columns, including this constant term column. So a three by five matrix. So whatever app you're using, you're gonna to have to make sure that you tell it the dimension of the matrix you're gonna enter. And so you put that in, you put in all of the entries, and then you let the calculator or the app do the work for you. All right, so I'm gonna then tell the calculator to put this into reduced row echelon form. So the command is usually RREF, on whatever app or computer calculator you're using. All right, so for this one, I already did that on this one. And so here's what I get, one, zero, negative one, one. And then there's no dash line on my ca calculator there, but I'm gonna put that here just to remind myself that that last column is representing what's on the other side of the equal sign here. Uh, and then in the second row, zero, one, 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 zero. And then the last row is all zeros. Okay, so I've let the calculator do the arithmetic that puts this matrix in reduced row echelon form. And then what we want to focus on here is being sure that we can interpret this and that we're clear about what this represents. All right, so one of the things I'm going to pay attention to is those leading ones in each row. Those leading ones in each row. There's one here and one here. Those are pivots. Those are what we call pivots. So we talked about that when we first did these. Those are our pivots. And the other thing that's important here is that each row of this new matrix put into reduced row echelon form represents an equation. Represents an equation that I would get if I did some arithmetic on this system and did elementary operations on that system. So it's important that you pay attention to what these rows all represent. You don't have to write down these equations every time. I'm gonna go ahead and do this for this one. Uh, so this first column are the coefficients of the x terms. The second column would be the coefficients of the y terms. So I don't have any y's in this first equation. Uh, and then the third column, coefficients of the z terms. And then coefficients of the w term. And then the equals is where my um, dashed line is. And then I have zero on the other side. Uh, so the second row, I have y 
plus z plus w equals zero. And then the last row, it's important also to pay attention to that, that represents the equation zero equals zero, which is always true. All right, so here I have a consistent system, right? This system that I now have an equivalent system to what I started with here. It's not the same system, but it has a, it's an equivalent system. It has the same solution set, it is consistent. These equations are all true, right? We already talked about that when all the variables are zero, that makes the first ones true. This last one's true for all values. And so now I want to write down what the solutions are. We already talked about that. We expected this to have infinitely many solutions. That tells how many solutions there are, but it doesn't tell what they are. All right, so I'm going to go back to my matrix here to think about that. These columns without a pivot are going to correspond to what I'm going to let be my free variables. They don't have to be free variables. You have two free variables in this system. I could choose to let them be x and y. But most of the time when you use an augmented matrix and you do reduce row echelon form, it's those columns without a pivot that are easiest to let be your free variables. So I'm going to let z and w be my free variables, which means those are going to be my parameters. I'm going to use t for my z and u for my w. So those are both free variables. Okay, so we know that that means those can be any number. All right, so what I want to do here from all of this work is go ahead and write down what is the solution set for this system. All right, so I've got my z and w equations here. I'm going to kind of put these, stack these up here. So I've got x, y, z, w kind of in order. You don't have to write them like that, but uh, so I'm going to put my w1 here at the end and z right above that, and then y right above that, and x right above that. All right, so my x and y solutions, I'm going to come from putting t and u into these two equations for z and w, and then isolating the x and the y. So for the x, I would have x minus t. Let me go ahead and put that here. So the z is going to be t, and the w is going to be u and then solve for x. So I'll have x equals t minus u, um, t minus u. And then similarly for the y, I'll put in uh, z equals t and w equals u and solve that one for y. So y equals negative t minus u. Uh, the other thing I might want to say about this is that t and u are both free variables, so those both can be any real number. Those are independent of each other. So once I've chosen values for t and u, then that determines all these other ones. So we'll certainly talk about some more. Some of you that have had some linear algebra might think about writing this solution in a different way also. We will be talking about that in the next couple days. And maybe could also think about some things related to the dimension of this solution space. So those are all things we're going to be talking about later. Uh, so we will get there, but for right now, we're just wanting to write down our solution using parameters. All right, I'm going to briefly modify this example just a little bit, enough to kind of illustrate one other thing that could happen and make sure that we're clear about how to write a solution for that system. Okay, so if instead of all zeros on the right-hand side, if instead of zero, I had a one here, now I still have an underdetermined under system, less equations than variables, but I no longer am guaranteed that I have at least one solution. Remember that how I was able to look at the original one and decide that I knew at least one solution existed was that it was very easy to see that all the variables being zero worked. So this one, I can't just glance at it and say, oh, there's obviously at least one solution. So I'm going to have to let the matrix tell me what's going to happen for this new one. All right, so for this new one, I would start off with the same matrix, except in this last spot, I would have a 1 instead of a 0. And then when I do reduced row echelon form of this new one, with the 1 here instead of the 0, I get almost the same matrix that I had here. So 
I've done that already on my calculator. I put this new matrix in. I do the command on my calculator, or you can use the app that we've talked about in class. And I'm going to get out a matrix that's almost like this matrix, but not quite. And so I just want to emphasize that one little feature that is going to tell me something different is happening with this new system. All right, so the first two rows actually end up the same. It's the last row where you will end up with this. Okay, and so sometimes I see students who look at something like this and they focus, as we did here, on the pivots and they don't really pay attention to the rest and they'll write down answers sort of like what we did before. But it's important to remember that each of these rows really represents an equation. Right? So the first two equations are going to be the same as what I had here. But that last equation for this matrix would represent the equation 0 equals 1, which is not true. 0 equals 1 is false. Right? And remembering that what it means to be a solution to any equation and in particular a system of linear equations is that you're looking for values for the variables that make all the equations true. So if I have an equation that is false, that means that this system has no solution. Zero equals one is not true. That is a false equation. So this new system that I wrote with this one here instead of the zero, it looks almost exactly the same. There's just this one little detail in that reduced row echelon form of the matrix that's important to pay attention to that tells me that I have a very dramatically different kind of situation for the solution set for this system. So this system has no solution, or we might say that it's an inconsistent system. So depending on how the question is asked in the online homework, sometimes they'll ask you to choose that there is a unique solution, infinitely many solutions with some parameters, or no solution, or sometimes they'll use words like a dependent system, or an inconsistent system, or a system with a unique solution. So just kind of paying attention to whatever it is they're asking you. Um, but the, the emphasis that I want to make here is that it's important to pay attention to all those details. It's important to pay attention to those pivots because those help you determine whether you have some free variables and how to write your answer. But it's also important to pay attention to the fact that these results really represent equations. And your equations need to be true in order for there to be a solution to that system of equations. So when you're doing that homework, the math here isn't hard, right? You're letting the calculator do the math. What you have to pay attention to is these little details from your results that tell you what, what is the solution that we're looking for for this system. All right, so try some homework. Also, I will say if you get the wrong answer, the first thing I would check is that you've written down your matrix correctly to start with and typed it into your calculator or your app correctly. It's so easy to drop a negative sign and then you get a result out and you think you know what's going on when it was really something else, right? So just double check that first if you're getting the wrong answer on any of that homework.